Today's lecture will be on secondary sources and finding tools. You might want to pull up the chapter 3 PowerPoint uh, if you're so inclined. Uh, you also might want to get out your book because I'm going to be referring to things uh, out of chapter 3 as I go along in this lecture. Okay. Let's talk generally about secondary sources. Remember, primary sources are the law itself. Cases, statute, administrative decisions. Secondary sources explain the law. Now, normally when I start a research project, I'll generally start with secondary sources. So why do I do that? Well, the main reason is, is if I'm researching a legal issue, I probably don't know a lot about it already. Uh, I want to get a general summary of the, or an overview of a particular uh, issue or area of law before I delve into the primary sources. So what secondary sources do is they explain the law to us in terms hopefully we can better understand um, than just going directly to the primary sources. So basically it's to get what I call background knowledge. Okay? We also use secondary sources as a type of finding tool because the secondary source when we read it is going to have citations or references to primary sources such as cases or statutes. And then we all be able to go actually pull those off the shelf, look them up on Westlaw or Lexis or whatever, and uh, read them for myself. Okay, the important thing you need to know right now is unless we absolutely cannot find any primary law, normally before a court we would not want to quote, to quote a secondary source. So what are some of the main secondary sources? I'm on page 37 of your book. Um, for the fifth edition, and they start with legal encyclopedias. And legal encyclopedias are a lot like an encyclopedia. In the old days, we had World Book uh, or Encyclopedia Britannica. Today, people would pretty much just use the internet. But um, what they will do is they will give you a general overview of the law. Okay, it will not normally be particularly detailed. Okay. For example, if I was going to pull uh, the old-fashioned uh, world book or Encyclopedia Britannica off the shelf and wanted to we read about World War II, it would give me a general um, you know, version of World War II and kind of hopefully a neutral, um, a neutral explanation. Okay. But if I wanted to know about the specific details, for example, the roundup of the Jews during the Holocaust in Poland. Okay, it might have a paragraph or two, but it certainly wouldn't go into the detail that if I was researching that legal issue. On the other hand, if I knew nothing about World War II, I would certainly want to uh, consult a, an encyclopedia so I at least have the background knowledge to understand what it was about and who was involved. Okay. The two main national encyclopedias that are specified in your book are what we call CJS, which is Corpus Juris Secondum, Secondum just means second, and Amjur Second, okay, or American Jurisprudence Second, we call it Amjur for short. Um, these will give you a general overview of the law on a national level, okay. It will give you citations to particular cases uh, according to various jurisdictions. So if you're in Iowa or North Dakota or somewhere like that, you would probably want to start with uh, CJS or Amjur. Okay, now in California, we wouldn't do that. Okay, the reason is is one of the benefits of being in California, as I've said before, is we have great secondary uh, materials specific to California law, and there are two encyclopedias that just deal with California law. The most widely read and respected encyclopedia is that of Bernard Witkin. Okay. Bernard Witkin is like the California authority on general California law. Okay. Uh, he publishes a uh, set of encyclopedias and we just call them Witkin. Okay. So everyone knows what Witkin is. Okay. There's actually four volumes. There's one on uh, civil law, there's one on criminal law. There's one on evidence and 
God, I can't remember the fourth one right now, but um, they're broken down into four volumes. And the, um, the other really good secondary source in California is Calger. Okay, Calger is just Amger, but it's California specific. Okay, now, when should you use Witkin versus Calger? Well, really, it's a matter of personal preference. Okay, a lot of times, I actually prefer uh, Calger. I just like the way it reads. One of the major differences between Calger and Witkin is that Witkin, these citations are actually in the body of the paragraphs itself, and I tend to find that annoying versus Calger, where the footnotes will be at the bottom of the page or at the end of the chapter. And so I find it a little bit easier to read for um, Calger, but they're both excellent resources. I would say the vast majority of attorneys um, uh, use Witkin. Okay, let me just tell you how important Witkin is. Okay, when I was taking the California bar exam, I decided that if I didn't know the law in a particular area and it dealt with California law, I was just going to make it up. Okay, and then I was going to say Witkin said it, and then I was going to apply whatever law that I made up to my answer. Okay, because most of the credit on the exam isn't always getting the law right, it's applying the law to the facts. Okay, so that's a little joke about how important uh, or what an authority Witkin is. Okay. Now, like I said, you can't cite secondary authority on California uh, uh, law to a judge generally. But a lot of times you can get away with saying, well, I got it right out of Witkin because Witkin is so widely accepted as the best resource on general California law. Okay. When you pull a book of Witkin off the shelf, or a Calger off the shelf. The most important, remember this, the most important thing is that you check the pocket part. Okay, now what is the pocket part? It's a little thing in paperback at the end of the book. Sometimes in Wiccan it'll be actually a separate book, okay, like I posted on this particular uh, uh, page on our home page. Uh, there's, there's, you can look, there's a picture of Witkin, and then there's a little paper-bound volume next to it. Um, the reason you have to check the pocket parts is, is that will contain the most recent discussion of the law. And the reason you need to check that is, is because you might read something for 20 minutes in Witkin or Calger, and then you go to the pocket part and you find out that the law has completely been changed. Okay, so when we do legal research, Rule number one, always check for a pocket part and read that first. Okay, now if you go to page 39 of your text, uh, at the bottom there's a little excerpt right out of uh, Amger and uh, Calger is set up exactly the same way. Okay, These subjects, just like an encyclopedia, are organized by topic. Okay, In this particular case, the topic is the uh, Fourth Amendment. Okay, so this particular um, uh, part of this is like the table of contents or the chapter summary. Okay, and it's broken up into uh, sections. You see, generally they will start with a general discuss discussion of the topic, saying what the article or that particular part of the encyclopedia will cover, and then it'll get into the uh, more specifics, as you can see here. It starts the first uh, subparagraph or subchapters in general. Then we get on who has a right to uh, challenge a uh, something under the Fourth Amendment, and uh, when unreasonable searches and seizures are prohibited, and how the amendment is applicable to the states. So, if I had an issue on whether a search was good or bad. Uh, I would pull, obviously, Calger off the shelf, shelf for California, but if I was in another state, probably Amger. And then I would uh, look in the index. I would see that there's a topic under searches and seizures. And then I would go pull that off the shelf and go to the table of contents and find uh, what particular section I am uh, looking for. Okay, here's a caveat. A lot of times, uh, there might not be anything specific on your area. Okay. That's, these are encyclopedias. They're more general. In that case, we'd have to go to a more specific practice guide, which there are lots of, fortunately, in California. Other states, uh, depending on the population, maybe not so much. 
If we move on to page uh, 41, you can actually see a page out of uh, Amger there. Okay, and we'd be reading about section one, which is generally on the issue of uh, searches and seizures under the uh, Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution. And one of the things I want to uh, uh, point you to is if you look under forms, uh, it'll refer you to uh, pre and practice, practice forms. For example, maybe you need to draft a motion to suppress evidence. And also, the thing I really want you to look at is that little key number in the middle of the page. Okay, That's the West key, key number system. And what that little key does, if we were actually on the computer, or uh, we can find this in, in print as well, that little key, what Wes does is, is they break down the entire world of law into sections. And we can jump from one section to another using that particular key. Now, if I was on the computer, I could click on that, and it would take me to all kinds of cases that have discussed this particular topic. Um, but we can also do that by print as well. There's there's the West key number system that I'll talk about or digest that we'll talk about later. So uh, what they do is they break down the entire legal world of issues into numbers. And these numbers help you go to the resources that you need to find cases in that particular area. Another publication that might be helpful in your legal research uh, that is kind of like an encyclopedia, but it's a little bit different, is ALR, or American Law Reports. Okay, now the way ALR works is it's not exhaustive and complete like Amger or um, uh, CJS, or in California, Witkin or, or Calger. Uh, what ALR does is they take a particular legal topic a very specific narrow legal topic or issue and they deal they deal with it or they write an article on it uh, in an exhaustive manner okay now my experience with ALR is is most of the time you won't find something uh, that covers the particular issue that you're researching but when you do it is like gold because it is so exhaustive and really covers every nuance of the issue that it's great. So if you're on a national level outside of California, or even if you are in California, and you know exactly the particular legal issue uh, that you're looking for, uh, ALR can be really, really good because it kind of does all your thinking for you, and it points you in the exact direction that you need to go to find the primary sources that you need to prepare your particular legal document. And if you look on page 46 of your text there, uh, it has a little um, excerpt from ALR. Okay, as you can see just by the table of contents and the particular section numbers, I'm looking at the bottom of 46, um, how much more specific it would be. So, for example, um, if I had an issue regarding um, the validity of concern of, of searches uh, where there was consent or where there was a warrant, or if there was a warrantless search, whatever it be, uh, I could go find that minute specific topic. And ALR, like I said, generally does a really good job in uh, uh, discussing that particular topic over several jurisdictions, not just um, one. Uh, the next uh, set of secondary materials that your book talks about are attorney general opinions. Okay, uh, attorney general opinions come come from the United States Attorney General on, I don't know, for example, they could write an opinion for the president on whether the use of waterboarding violates the Geneva Convention. Or uh, the state of California uh, attorney general, who's uh, Camila Harris right now, uh, she could write a uh, opinion advising the uh, governor on uh, any particular topic relevant to California law. Uh, in my experience, uh, attorney general opinions are generally not particularly helpful. Uh, you can find uh, citations to primary authority on what their uh, reasoning or basis of, but they are not law. Okay, they're just one person. Now, in this case, an attorney general of the state or the United States government. It's just the one person's opinion on 
interpreting what the law is. Okay, so that's why they're secondary. Okay, primary is a judge's interpretation of what the law is. Uh, an attorney general opinion is merely a legal expert's opinion on what the law means or says. The next uh, secondary source is what we call restatements. Okay, in my opinion, restatements are not really helpful. Okay, what restatements are is they are written by legal experts, usually law professors, and provide a comprehensive summary on what the law is. Now, as an intellectual exercise, they're really good. Okay, particularly when you're in law school and you and you uh, want to have a general understanding of the law. But in terms of holding weight before a judge, unless you can find, we can't find any primary authority, I would not, um, you know, recommend ever citing a restatement to a judge. Um, they're just too intellectual and too kind of ivory towerish, really for the practical nuts and bolts of, of legal research and the law. Um, so that's my particular take on them. And that's why I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about them. They're basically just law professors kind of showing each other how smart they are, in my opinion. Okay. Um, now, the next one that they talk about are um, legal treatises. They are in the same, um, same boat for me as uh, restatements of the law. Okay. Uh, these are, are normally uh, written by uh, law professors and uh, um, generally unhelpful. Although intellectually complete, I will give them that. Okay. Uh, the next uh, section uh, talks about legal dictionaries. Okay, legal dictionaries can be an important resource. Okay, this is why is because legal dictionaries um, will help us, uh, you know, give us definitions to words we don't understand. The the most common one and popular one by far is Black's Law Dictionary. Okay, Ballantine's also publishes one, but everybody uses Black. Okay, uh, Blacks. Okay. Um, now, on the other hand, there is another kind of legal dictionary that's really helpful, okay, and it's called uh, words and phrases, okay. This is a judicial uh, legal dictionary, and the way it works is, is let's say we have a particular uh, word, I don't know, uh, dog, that's an easy one. Okay, what words and phrases will do is we can go to the wor words and phrases um, uh, volume or resource, and we can look at uh, cases that have, have, have decided or interpreted what the word dog means. Okay, obviously it doesn't have to be dog, but it could be anything, race judicata, which I'm sure you don't know means, collateral estoppel. Um, whatever the word means, words and phrases will give us judicial interpretations of what, how that word has been interpreted in the courts throughout the country. You can see an example of words and phrases on page 67 of your book, okay? For example, uh, there's a definition of easement, an easement appurtenant, and easement in gross. Uh, and uh, you can see, okay, like if we were in California, easement of way, okay, that was uh, cited, if you wanna look there on page 57, by the California uh, uh, Appellate Court, uh, the second district. And they've uh, had a specific definition of easement of way. And if that was our issue, that would be really helpful. And we would want to read that case there, um, which is Prokop versus City of Los Angeles. And then we could find it. We'll learn how to find cases later. And also we could look at the particular law uh, that uh, defined easement of way, which is West Annotated California Government Code Section 831.4C. Uh, so I could pull the government code off the shelf and actually read it for myself. The next one they put in there, I, I really don't even know why it's in here, but it is, which are legal directories. Okay, it's not really a legal resource in terms of the law, um, but you need to be aware of Martindale Hubble. Okay, Martindale Hubble is a publisher that basically lists every attorney in every state uh, in the United States. Okay, um, and it's a big thing to, to actually have a, a listing in Martindale Hubble. Okay, most, if not all, major law firms actually pay Martindale Hubble to uh, look in uh, or to be listed uh, in Martindale Hubble. Okay, they'll have firm profiles, they'll have a list of the attorneys, uh, their uh, where they went to law school, um, also um, 
what areas they practice in, and things like that. It's generally done uh, by firm, okay, as opposed to individual attorney, unless you're a solo practitioner. For example, you know, I had a listing in Martindale Hubble, um, and uh, but if you do not pay them to have actually a page or a listing in their publication, they will still at least list you in there, although your uh, biographical information will not be included. Okay, but most attorneys of any kind of note uh, pay Martin Double Hubble to be in their book. Okay, the thing I do want to talk to you about, and this is important for most attorneys like me, is Martindale Hubble has a rating system for attorneys. Okay, it's based on A, B, or C, just like the grade you're going to get in this class, um, and um, or not listed. Okay, now uh, if they are not rated, that does not mean they're a bad attorney. Okay, but most attorneys like to be rated. Okay, um, C is, and, and it's, and then they'll have a V after it. So CV, the V means ethics, which means they have uh, very high ethics. Okay, and uh, so um, when I first became an attorney, uh, after a few years, uh, you apply to Martindale Hubble, and then they have your peers in your community rate you. Okay, uh, I, when I started, of course, I got a C rating, which meant I was, you know, competent and a good attorney. Um, after about 10 years of practice, uh, you can move up to uh, a B rating, okay? Now, I never went and got re-rated, but I certainly could have been uh, considered a B attorney and, you know, no problem. I just never bothered to get re-rated. And uh, then there's A-rated attorneys. A-rated attorneys are generally considered the uh, uh, top or best attorneys uh, in their particular practice area in, in their firm, okay? So if you were in Bakersfield, like uh, Ed Thomas, who's the best family law attorney, he's, a, he's an A-rated attorney. Um, all of the name partners in the largest firms at Bakersfield are going to be A-rated attorneys. And most people consider it a big deal to be rated, an A-rated attorney. Okay? Um, but remember, this is just their recommendation. Um, so if an A-rated attorney screws you over, don't blame me. Okay, the next set of... Um, uh, secondary sources that they talk about them on page 60 are form books, okay? And they only talk about them briefly, which I think is a little, real weird because form books are like the best thing to have if you're a practitioner like I am, okay? If you do litigation, if you do transactional work, what form books do is they will actually give you the forms in fill in the blank form. So all you really have to do is download them from Lexis or Westlaw, or maybe your library has CD-ROM, and then fill in the blanks. Okay, it's not as easy as that, but it does take a lot of the work out of the practice, uh, out of the process. Okay, now in California, I'm going to talk about a couple of, of ones that are indispensable. Okay, if your attorney practices transactional law, which means he drafts contracts, he uh, you know like employment agreements or contracts between businessmen or drafts deeds uh, for property or uh, forms uh, corporations or LLCs or LLPs uh, or partnership agreements, things like that. The resource everybody uses is Matthew Bender's California Legal Forms, okay? If I have to draft something like that, which I rarely do because I'm a litigator, uh, I go to California Legal Forms and almost every time they will find a I'll be able to find a uh, document uh, where I can fill in the blanks that is really, really good for that particular subject, okay? Because most lawyers just don't draft contracts out of thin air, okay? They go to practice guides like California uh, Legal Forms and go get it and then modify it to the needs of their clients. The other California uh, 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 form book that I use all the time, actually there's two sets, that I use all the time as a litigator or used to use uh, is uh, another Matthew Bender publication, which is called uh, California Forms of Pleading and Practice. California Pleading and Practice. Okay, this is my opinion. If your attorney practices litigation, something you absolutely have to use. Okay, most of the time. I go right to California Pleading and Practice, okay? And the reason, now what does it have? It has things like forms for drafting complaints, formats for drafting motions, um, whatever whatever civil procedure issue or form I have to fill out, most of the time it's gonna be in California Pleading and Practice. 
and it saves me a ton of time to go there. Okay. What's great also about California Pleading Practice, it's not just a form book. It will give you a summary of the law so you, how, so you understand how, uh, you know, why the things are in the form that, that it has. It'll also give you citations to the major cases um, that form the legal basis for their explanation of, of the law. Okay, and it's also a how-to guide. It'll also, after the form, it'll tell you what you have to put in the form and why it needs to be in there. Okay, so in my opinion, California Pleading, Pleading Practice by far was the most used resource for me as a litigation attorney. The next one uh, is absolutely indispensable if you prepare motions. Okay, um, it's called California points and authorities. Okay, so what are points and authorities? Points and authorities are the law that we put in a motion for the judge to use to decide how to rule on the motion. Okay, now a little bit of caution here. Okay, when you find a, a, uh, a particular uh, uh, topic in California uh, points and authorities, a lot of times it's not exhaustive, which means it'll have the major cases and the major paragraphs that you want to put into the law section of your motion, but it's not exhaustive. There will be cases out there that are not discussed in California points and authorities, but if it's a, basically a random or I mean a routine type of motion, most of the time we can go straight to California authority, points and authorities, pull out the form slap it into our motion and we've got our law. Then all we have to do is we have to obviously put in facts, apply the facts to the law and come to the conclusion that our client should win. Okay, but um, in California points and authorities is all you need for the most part for drafting all but the most complex motions. The chapter next talks about what we call loose leaf services. Okay, uh, loose leaf, the reason that they call them loose leaf is, is because they're not bound in a book. Okay. And in a way, like uh, things like California Pleading Practice and Points and Authorities are loose leaf because they're just actually pages you can pull out, which is great, and copy them and, and things like that and put them back in. Uh, but when we think of loose leaf, so we normally think of, of, of two, two uh, uh, major publications, and they're generally applied to uh, uh, the most major ones are for tax law. Okay, and those are, are the Bureau of National Affairs and CCH, which is Commerce Clearinghouse. Okay. Uh, the, the, they're generally more business practice oriented. Okay, if you practice, uh, if your attorney practices tax law, these would absolutely be the resources you would you would uh, look at. Okay, so they're not in books; they're more kind of in uh, uh, notebooks or uh, clippy kind of notebooks. The other way they they come out is uh, they're really kind of like uh, like uh, for example, uh, BNA is like a newsletter. Okay, that comes out every month. And then they throw that uh, particular newsletter in the in the bound volume. Okay, so a lot of times you have to actually go to the index and use the index to look for the particular topic that you're looking for, as opposed to just kind of generally browsing through the particular volumes of BNA or CCH. The next topic in the book is legal um, periodicals. Okay, uh, the first one that they talk about are uh, law review. Uh, Articles. Okay, let me tell you what law reviews are. Okay, law review. Every major law school in America has a law review. Okay, and in that they publish scholarly articles uh, in there about certain topics. Uh, in my opinion, they are really not very helpful. Okay, um, they generally deal with a esoteric issue of the law. Um, they, they aren't very practical in terms of uh, using them to uh, practice law with. So why do they have them? Well, it's more a, a matter of prestige. Um, every law school feels they need to have a law journal to be respected, and so they have one. It also provides an outlet to their professors to publish uh, um, articles on their particular specialty of the law. And most law schools require their professors to uh, publish every uh, few years a major article, and then they appear in the um, in the law reviews. Okay, sometimes articles are also written by uh, students themselves, the top uh, um, you know people in the school. It's a big deal to be like an editor 
or uh, write an article for a um, law review. Okay, but they're generally written by professors, and it's a big deal to be on law review in in, in um, college. I didn't do it, or in law school, I didn't do it. Um, it's it's a lot of work, and you know it does help you get a job. So that's kind of why people um, people participate in um, law journals. But there is one that uh, actually might be helpful in California. I will toot my own uh, alma mater, McGeorge School of Law. Um, and in the in the uh, McGeorge uh, Law School um, uh, Journal, uh, they have a thing at, every year they publish called Green Sheets. And since they're in Sacramento, one of the things that they do in the Green Sheets is they provide a summary of the major legislation passed by the California legislature every year and then they try to tell you what they think it means so in a way it's like an attorney general opinion uh, on what he thinks the law means uh, in this case it's the students and the professors at McGeorge summarizing what they think the uh, effect of a particular uh, major law passed in California during the last year uh, what it means so if you're late researching a new law um, you might want to check out green sheets. Okay, now let's talk about digests. Okay, digests are really important. Okay, unlike some of this other stuff. Digests are really important. So what are they? Okay, digests contain summaries of the law. Okay, and most of us call these what we call blurbs. Okay, they're organized like in legal encyclopedias by topic matter. Okay. So search and seizure, uh, slip and fall in torts, whatever it might be. Okay, what the digests do is like in the West system, I told you about those key numbers. Okay, what those key numbers do is they direct you to they that particular area of the law in the digest system. So when I pull up, um, you know, a legal research article or a, a secondary source of any kind, and it's a West system, they'll have key numbers in there. And those key numbers will direct me to the digest. And then I can go either look up, up online or pull the digest just off the um, shelf at the law library and look under that particular topic. And then it'll have like one or two sentence, um, what are, one or two um, sentence um, summaries of the cases and what they believe the judge held or decided in that particular case under that particular issue of law. Okay, so let's say I had a search and seizure issue under, under the Constitution or California law. I could jump in the West Digest system and it would summarize most of the major cases and decisions under that particular issue. Included in the digest will be the citation to the case, and I'll teach you how to find cases later. But what I can do is once I have that little blurb or that little little uh, uh, two or three sentence summary, I can go pull the case off the shelf and read it for myself and see if the blurb actually matches to what the judge says. You can see a uh, comprehensive list of all of the particular um, digest topics beginning on page uh, 68 of your book. Okay, it starts with abandoned and lost property and it ends with zoning and planning. Okay, and in each of those particular uh, 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 things, there'll be key numbers broken down literally into hundreds of subtopics and issues. And I could go find, for example, if I had abandoned and lost property, I would pull volume number one. It'll have abandoned and lost property and then I can uh, look in the table of contents and go to the specific issue that I need to find and read generally about the case. Okay, now there are actually two sets of digests. Okay, warning here in California, there are two sets of digests. Okay, one is the Basically, it's just called the California Digest of Official Reports. And the other is West California Digest. Okay, now why are there two in California? Is because West is the not the official publisher of California cases. Uh, another company called, uh, I believe it's Deering's is. Okay, so in California, 
we have a set of uh, digests published by Westlaw. And we have another set that is actually linked to the official uh, California uh, uh, cases, the, what we call the California reporters. Um, I've used both. And I'm flat out telling you, sometimes you will find things in the West Digest that you will not find in the official California Digest and vice versa. So if you're looking at the Digest and you really don't find a case that is on point and you're using West, you have to go to the other Digest. And it's called California Digest uh, of Official uh, reports. Okay, so there's a little nuance there in California. We actually have two sets of digests. What's the main difference between the two? Uh, well, in my opinion, the official California Digest is a little more exhaustive. Okay, in terms of the discussions in the West Digest tend to be two or three sentences. The discussions in the official California Digest, I think they, I, I'm not sure if it's Deering's or not, but it tends to be a little, give you a little more detailed explanation. So where West will have two or three sentences, um, or maybe even one sentence, the uh, California official Digest will have maybe a paragraph. Okay, so it's just really a matter of preference on which one you want to use. So generally what Digests do is they help us to find cases. If this is a little confusing, just email me. Um, the, and if some of you are confused, I'll try to explain that with some kind of visual detail on that uh, uh, in, a, in kind of a supplemental lecture if you want. Or we could uh, talk about it online. That's the end of um, the uh, chapter. But I want to add a, a few um, a few more uh, things. Uh, I've attached on, on our... Um, on our class, uh, you know, website, a uh, a document where I list some of my favorite secondary sources. Okay, now uh, here's a caveat: I didn't practice criminal law, so I don't know what the best criminal law resources are. But if you're looking on specific topics, um, I'm going to cover uh, a few more here that that um, deal only with California law. Okay. As I said before, if we're just looking for a general summary of the law, Witkin and Calger are really, really good. Okay, some people prefer Witkin, some people prefer Calger. Uh, I actually use them both. Okay, but let's get into the specific ones. Okay, uh, for civil procedure, I've already talked about California Pleading and Practice by Matthew Bender and California Points and Authorities are the best. Okay, but there's another guide out there that is actually really, really good, and I haven't mentioned it, which is the Rudder Group. Okay, the Rudder Group publishes a whole set of volumes of subject specific topics okay um, the best one and that is absolutely so indispensable I had a copy in my office because I used it all the time is the Rudder group on uh, civil procedure before trial and what it does how it's different than like California pleading practice it's more specific. It's more about the nuts and bolts of the actual practice of civil procedure than it is theoretical. Okay, and it's exhaustive and detailed. And every lit if you work for a litigator, um, he'll have a copy in his office. It's a three-volume set. You can pull up the document. Uh, it's a blue one. But they also have really good guides uh, on other things like family law or personal injury. Or appeals, uh, things like that. Um, if you want to find out exactly what they have, uh, either visit the library or go online and just type in the Rudder Group, and you can they can have a list. They'll show you a list of their practice guides. I find them very good myself, although they're not real theoretical. They're very practical. Okay, uh, the next one that you absolutely have to know about if you have an issue on evidence, and that is Jefferson's California Evidence Bench Book. It's, it's um, uh, published by what we call CEB, and CEB is short for Continuing Education of the Bar. They have a lot of really good practice guides as well. I just don't have time to get into all of them. Um, but you have to know about Ev Je Jefferson's Evidence Bench Book. It is the authority on an issue of evidence in California. If you have any issue on evidence, you go right to Jefferson and hope to God there's something in there. Because if it is and it's right on point, you're going to win. 
every you know now when I say secondary sources are not the law uh, that primary sources are are I'll flat out tell you Jefferson's is so good and so respected that if you just quoted something right out of Jefferson to a judge they would buy it okay it, it is the authority on evidence in California Witkin Pro produces uh, or publishes a section on evidence but it's not authoritarian as authoritarian authoritative as Jefferson okay uh, real estate uh, California real estate uh, we, we just call it Miller and Starr by its authors start every real, uh, real estate project by consulting Miller and Starr okay it's the authority on real estate law in California it's 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 kind of a practice guide it has forms in it as well that are really helpful um, and uh, just go to Miller and Starr if you got a real estate issue okay uh, Another one I've already talked about is uh, uh, for transactional matters, uh, California Legal Forms, also published by Matt, Matthew Bender. And then the last one, which isn't specific to California, uh, but you should know about, which is if you have a bankruptcy issue, Collier on Bankruptcy is without a doubt the, the most complete um, uh, resource on bankruptcy law. Okay, Bankruptcy law is the same throughout the United States. It's exclusively federal law. But if you have bankruptcy issues, Collier is, Collier is the authority. It's Collier on bankruptcy law. Okay, uh, that's it for the lecture uh, this week. Um, I will have a uh, an assignment up for you in uh, a few days. The reason it's not up uh, today, which is Monday, is because of uh, the fact that a lot of you don't have access to the law library. And so I'm going to go to the law library. I'm going to download or photocopy. Actually, I'm going to email them to me. Um, the stuff you need to read to find the information that I want you to find. On the other hand, I would absolutely recommend that instead of doing the shortcut way, which is letting the spoon feed you the stuff so you don't have to go look for it, that you actually go to the law library and sit down and do your homework right there in the law library, okay? Because you'll get familiar with the books and the resources and you'll be familiar with the process of actually going and finding the stuff yourself. Uh, you can do it online as well, like at Saracosa. You could go to the go to the uh, um, the uh, library and uh, log on to uh, LexisNexis terminal through the Kern County Law Library, or I mean the Westlaw uh, terminal, and uh, whatever it is. Basically, it's a link to the online resources at the Kern County Law Library. And uh, you could do this online as well, okay? So if you want to do it the hard way, which is what I totally recommend that you do, do it. If you don't have access to uh, uh, online uh, computer databases like Lexis and Westlaw, as you would at the uh, Saracoso, um, Law Li uh, Saracoso Library, um, then uh, you can just do it the easy way where I will post the stuff and you can just look at it and do it that way. Okay, you guys have a great week. Uh, hope you're enjoying the class. Um, and I guess uh, when I get the homework up, you can get to work. And don't forget to read this week's chapter.